This is a day that is utterly baffling to those who do not know and love Jesus. Why do we gather? Why do we come here with lights dimmed, somber faces, muted clothing at times? Why do we do all this, especially as people who know how the story ends? Why do we celebrate in the death of a man? Why would we call a day like that good? It looks like nonsense to those who are outside, and yet for us, it is such a significant day that while we look forward to this weekend and the celebrations and the fun activities that we have planned, we cannot skip past Good Friday because Easter is meaningless without Good Friday. So we wait, we pause, we reflect. We as a people do not like to wait. I think of the the Stanford marshmallow test where kids were brought in and were given a marshmallow and said, you can eat this or you can wait and you will actually get two marshmallows if you wait. And yet many of those kids went with the treat that they didn't have to wait for. This is the same type of idea that's led to the success of mobile games on Android and iOS There's a a formula there where you can play the game for a little bit and then there's a cool down period, a time where you have to pause, you have to wait until that time runs out and then you can play again unless if you pay some money to speed that time up to make it so you didn't have to wait. One of the first things that family would do when they enter Disneyland or Disney World is go straight to the fast passes where you can get a ticket which means you can't ride the ride right now, but when your time comes up, you can skip the line, skip the wait, and go right to the front of it. After coming out of COVID, Disney has done away with fast pass lines. They instead went to a paid service. So pay to park, pay to get in, and now pay to wait? Would people actually do this? report came out a couple months ago that actually one-third of all Disney park attenders take this service. It's led to the fact that Disney parks had a higher profit than they did before COVID, even with substantially fewer attendees. We do not like to wait, but Good Friday is a time where we must do exactly that where we pause, we look to the cross, we see what was done on this day that has so changed us, that has so changed human history. It's why we have these gaps in here. It's why we've not had every moment of this service jam-packed with events for us to do. It's why we are taking things quieter, more reflective. It's why we will take communion in a way that is slow and deliberately slow, so we can pause, so we can reflect, so we can see what it was that Jesus has done. While we are excited for Easter, we are excited for the events that will take place, and we might feel that urge to rush towards the bright lights and the pastels that will come, We need to wait. And part of that is, in fact, because Jesus himself waited on Good Friday. We read Mark 15 throughout this service, and and we're going to continue to stay in that chapter. And I think Mark writes this in a way to get us to wait. If you know anything about the gospel of Mark, is Mark does not seem to be one who likes to wait either. It's the shortest of the Gospels. The words he uses are sparse. We're lacking for details throughout. He moves from event to event with immediacy. And yet, Mark spends one whole chapter, one sixteenth of his Gospel, not on Jesus' miracles, 
not on Jesus' teaching, but on his death and what the significance of that is. As you read through these Gospels, it's written in a way where these details are there to slow us down, to cause us to pause, to cause us to reflect on what it is that Jesus is doing. And we see within these details, Jesus himself is waiting. These Roman officials are there, these soldiers who are tasked with bringing forth justice. They have Jesus in their custody, and yet they also add mocking to their job descriptions. We read this in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 18. It says, And they, these soldiers, begin to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. They have this fake salute to this individual. And yet, what do we not see Jesus do? Jesus doesn't speak up and come to his defense, even though he could have. Jesus doesn't point out the fact that he has done nothing wrong. He did nothing to earn this treatment, this false imprisonment, though he could have. He doesn't point out that actually what you're saying about me, all of that, well, that is in fact true. King of the Jews, I am he. King of all people, king of kings. But Jesus does not do that either. He waits. And we all wait for the day when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, and that as he goes to this cross, we see that he is on his way to his throne, and we look forward to the day when this waiting is done as we get to worship him there. We wait on Good Friday because Jesus waits as well. We see this shocking pronouncement from one of those Roman soldiers, the centurion, one of those tasked with overseeing this death, is what we read in verse 39. It says, and the centurion, or when in, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we spend every single page, every chapter since he says that, waiting for someone to realize this, waiting for someone to confess that this is who he is, waiting for someone to say, truly, this man is the Son of God, and we finally reach that point here with a Gentile, with someone who is tasked with killing him, says that phrase. This ought to have been the pronouncement of everyone. As Jesus goes to the death, which he predicted, to cover the sins of the world, as he predicted, so that we all might be called sons and daughters of God, again, as he predicted, all ought to have seen him go to that fate, that fate and pronounce these words, truly this man was the Son of God. But only one does. And we wait weeks until people finally realize that uh, in mass that this was true about this Jesus, as thousands believe in the early pages of Acts, and we wait as we see people that we know and people that we love turn to him, and, and year after year, we see numbers added to the billions who have said these words over the years since Jesus died and was raised again, and yet we are still waiting. We're still waiting until that day when all are confronted with this, that every knee will be bowed, every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord, will confess truly this man is the Son of God. Jesus waited on Good Friday, so we wait on this day as well. 
as Mark records Jesus' last words in this gospel, we hear some tremendous, a tremendous statement. This is verse 34. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's much written about this phrase. Is this Jesus speaking out of his humanity that he's going through this pain and it is excruciating pain and he's speaking out of that hurt? It's understandable. Or is this Jesus experiencing the judgment that should have, should have been ours, that our sin took him, uh, our sin needed covering, and so Jesus goes and takes the judgment for that sin that we had earned, and he takes that for us, and, and so he's feeling that, and he's crying out of those, that, that, that state that he's in. It, it could be that as well. But I think these readings miss something important. They miss the hope that is in this passage. They miss what makes Good Friday good. Because these words of Jesus, they're a quotation from the Old Testament. Psalm 22, verse 1. And there was a way of quoting the Old Testament at this time that was, that was popular where you quote the first line of a section or a popular part of it. And, and what you're doing, you're not just referencing that verse, you're referencing the whole. So when Jesus quotes Psalm 22, verse 1, I think he wants us to go and read all of Psalm 22. He quotes these words, yes, out of his pain and suffering, but because there is more that is occurring in the story. Psalm 22 is a lament, someone who feels God's distance and wondering, when will God act? And then it's the turning at the end to see God will do exactly what he says he will do. God will keep every one of his promises. Psalm 22, verse 27. And all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. And it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations, and they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people not yet born, that he has done it. Why do we wait on this day? It's because we are waiting for that day when all things are made new that the brokenness of this world is restored as we stand in worship and awe before our good God who paid everything to cover our sins, our rebellion, the cost of our going against him, that Jesus goes to the cross on his way to his throne and we celebrate this day, we call it good because of those last words, he has done it. The cross on Good Friday causes us to wait, to reflect. And we need to do this. We need to remember what was accomplished for us on this day. And we wait because we see Jesus do the same as well. While we will have celebrations, what we see happen because Jesus waited because Jesus was faithful, because Jesus remained silent, because Jesus uh, went through the suffering, because Jesus remained obedience, we will have an eternity of days that we can call good. This is the hope that brings us here. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We were made to be with God in perfect relationship with him. He gave us a way to live that was for our good, that brought us joy, and yet we turned aside from him. The cost of rebellion, the cost of treason, the cost of this sin is death. The separation from him, deprived of all hope with certain doom as our future. 
And so when we wait, when we think about the price that was paid for us as Jesus receives these wounds rather than worship, when he gets this punishment rather than praise, when he gets this affliction rather than affection, as we see what Jesus did on the cross, we see the love of God who stopped at nothing to bring us back to him. In a moment, we're going to have time to pause to reflect, to wait, to look at what it was that Jesus did on this Good Friday, to look at what it was that he accomplished on his cross, to see that it was our sin that separated from us from him, and yet Jesus came to us, and he took that sin, paid that price, died the death that ought to have been ours. So the question that I have for us as we are waiting, what did Jesus take from you? What was the rebellion that's in all of us? What was, that, uh, what was it that Jesus took from us and crucified it on the cross with him? This might be some sin that we have in our life that if other people heard of it, it would just ruin us. This might be the anger that we explode in when things don't go our way. This might be the mindset that we have, that we all have, that think that I know better. I know what's best for me. This might be our uh, fear that comes out when we don't trust in God's provision. This might be uh, a lack of trust that we demonstrate when, when things go wrong. What was it that Jesus took from you on this day? We'll have time to pause, time to reflect, and then a time to take communion together to celebrate what it was that Jesus has done. Communion goes back to just a few, uh, a few hours before Jesus was erected, uh, arrested. He was with his disciples, having a meal with them, telling them exactly what it was that he was about to do. He said, my body will be broken. This is me going to pay this price to take this death that all of humanity has earned. I will take that. And he demonstrated this by grabbing the bread and breaking it. He said, this is a new covenant. How can we trust these promises? How will we know that this is true? Well, my blood will be spilled. He symbolized that by taking the cup. When we take communion together, we are remembering what it is that Jesus has done. Now, we will be taking communion a little bit different than we have been in our entire history of being a church. You see, we have two stations up here in the front, one station in the back off in the corner over there. It invites you after this time of waiting, of reflecting, of thinking what did Jesus accomplish, what did Jesus take from me, invites you to come up as an individual or family or anyone that you came with to take communion together. I'm going to invite uh, the, the couples that we've asked to pass out communion to, to head to their stations at this time. When you go to that place, you will be given the bread for you to take. You will be given the cup for you to take at the station itself. And then these families will pray for you as you take communion, as we reflect on what it is that Jesus did on this day. You can line up for this station, this aisle, this station, and this aisle. For the one in the back, you can line up against the back wall for that. There's no rush to go through this. It is slow for a reason. It is purposely done to have us focus on what it was that Jesus accomplished with his death, with his resurrection. I encourage you to wait, to not rush through this, to not jump ahead to Easter, but to pause and reflect on why this day is good, to think through what Jesus has taken from you, but then to come and rejoice in the fact that those sins are not yours anymore. They died on this Good Friday. That it wasn't our rebellions that forced Jesus to have to do this, but out of his great love for us, for you, 
He willingly went to pay a price that we never could have. These sins are not yours anymore. Jesus has taken them. And that is why we wait on Good Friday. So do so. Pause. Reflect. When you're ready, come as an individual, come as a family, to take communion at these stations as we continue to think through why is this Friday so good? Why are we so excited for an eternity of days that are good?